In section 9.2, we're um, tackling the topic of exponential function. And this is a new class of functions that we have not dealt with before, but it's going to uh, be in some ways familiar to us in terms of the way we've evaluated functions in the past. But there are some special properties of these exponential functions that make them really interesting functions uh, in mathematics. But they also have a lot of real world applications and appear in different kinds of disciplines, including finance, cell biology, and so on, that make these really important functions to study. So our objectives in this lecture are to first identify exponential functions, what they look like, the general form of them, uh, we then want to maybe go through a couple of examples so that we have an idea of what these real life applications of exponential functions are, what they feel like. Um, then we're going to relate exponential functions to their parent function. That is, we're going back into the idea of transforming a parent function. Remember, we can move or transform a parent function um, algebraically, and that manipulates different aspects of the graph of that function. We can move the graph up or down, left and right. We can also stretch them vertically or compress them vertically. Uh, we can also apply different kinds of reflections onto the parent functions and then see how those things emerge in the graph. Okay. So once we do that, we're going to explore uh, some graphs of exponential functions just so that we have a good smattering of exponential functions to look at. Um, then. We want to be able to identify the natural exponential function, which is this new guy, f of x is equal to e to the x. And we'll talk more about the value of e a little bit later on. Uh, at the end of this lecture, we will look at one uh, example problem that you will run into in the homework platform, Alex, uh, that involves a real world finance problem using exponential functions. OK, so to start off, what is an exponential function? Uh, an exponential function is any function that takes the form uh, f of x equals b raised to the x power. So that's what you really want to focus on here. Uh, these two components of that exponential function. So first, the b uh, can be any number. It could be a whole number, positive or negative. Uh, it could be a fraction or a decimal. But b is referred to as the base of the exponential function. OK, and that will change from problem to problem. Uh, but the x, as always, is going to refer to the input of the function. So just as with previous functions, if you're given the notation f of x, that is telling you x is the input value. If I give you a number for x, you will simply plug that into the function. In this context, that means that we're going to be plugging a value and changing the exponent part of this expression. Okay. Often in life, we hear that something is experiencing exponential growth. And so because that is common parlance in our daily lives, we probably have an intuitive understanding of what it means to grow exponentially. But exponential functions have many real-world applications, from finance to cellular biology. And we want to sort of explore some of these examples so that we can understand better the power of exponential growth and exponential function. So first, I want you to imagine a job offer. Uh, you apply for a job that offers one of two salary structures, and you have to choose between them. Plan A says that for a month's worth of work, uh, you accept a pay of $1 million. Okay. Plan B says that uh, you will accept two cents on the first day of that month, and every day after, the salary is double. So again, plan B is you receive two cents on day one. On day two, that doubles to four cents. On day three, that doubles again to be eight cents and then 16 cents the following day, and so on and so forth. So now I pose the question to you, which salary structure would you choose? What sounds like it's more beneficial to your bank account? 
Well, let's look at each of the plans separately and maybe a little bit slowly so we can understand the problem fully. So plan A is just a lump sum. That means that we are just receiving at the end of that month of work, the $1 million. And for most of us, that feels like quite a bit of money, probably more money than we've ever seen or handled personally. Uh, so that is cause for celebration because after one month of work, you would become a millionaire, okay? There's nothing particularly interesting about this pay structure. Uh, you get that one lump sum at the end of the month of work, and then you move on with your life, uh, presumably richer and happier. But uh, if we choose to take this, then we're foregoing plan B. And there's something a little bit more interesting that's going on with plan B because that is the exponential rate at which that salary will grow. So it doesn't sound too good at the very beginning. Like we said, on day one, we're getting just two cents and that's doubling on day two to four cents. On day three, we get eight cents and day four, we get 16 cents. And if that process continues after a week, so on day seven, we've amounted, uh, one dollar and 28 cents but if we follow this process a little bit further out let's say we go to two weeks which is day 14 you've already made 163 dollars and 84 cents so that's a lot bigger than what we started out with since day one was a pay of 0 0.02 dollars or two cents right so week three would be seven days later which is 21 on day 21 you have received $20,971.52. Okay. And by the end of that month, at the end of that 30-day period, your money has doubled consistently day in and day out until you have well over $10 million. Uh, we see here in the table that on day 30, we should have Ten million seven hundred and thirty-seven thousand four hundred and eighteen dollars and twenty-four cents. So again, Plan B was deceptively the better option because if you just saw this, these two plans given to you, and they were explained to you, and you hear one million dollars, that sounds like the better plan because it's a lot more money, but the face value of it is greater but the reality is if we do a little bit of math we can see that by the end of a month if we start off with two cents and double for every single day through that 30-day period we're going to have 10 times the amount of money that plan a offers so if you um kind of quickly jump at the $1 million plan, well, you're missing out on an additional nine to $10 million that you could have had in your pocket, okay? And that's the interesting thing about exponential functions. When we say something grows exponentially, it grows so quickly and it's almost an astonishing rate. Uh, again, on face value, Plan B didn't seem like it would grow to anywhere close to $1 million, starting off with two cents that doesn't seem logical, but through the power of exponential uh, functions, we can grow that two cents all the way to almost $11 million. So when we're working with exponential functions, we have to be aware of that process. And exponential functions are really good at describing a process of growth and in other contexts, a process of really rapid decay. So we need to understand that even though these numbers may start off small, very quickly, the numbers will grow to be larger and larger and larger, okay? So another example that takes us away from the world of finance and the world of money is this one. Uh, a research scientist studying the cell division of cancer cells might begin documenting how many count cancer cells um, she grows in a Petri dish in culture, okay? So on day zero, you can imagine you're starting off with just one cancer cell in that Petri dish. 
but that petri dish has a lot of nutrients in it that the cell can uh, utilize to grow and then it'll undergo a process of mitosis and then divide into two more cells. So let's say that on day two, that researcher, she checked back on her science experiment and now the first cell has divided into two daughter cells. On day two, those two daughter cells each would have divided into two cells. So now you have a total of four cells. On day three, you have a total of eight cells. On day four, you have a total of 16 cells and so on and so forth, okay? A function that describes this process of a cell dividing into two daughter cells over and over can be written as f of x is equal to two raised to the x power, where x refers to the time in days and the base two refers to how many cells the initial parent cell is dividing into. Okay. So that's just another example of um, an exponential function that is used in a real world application. But let's take a look at just some exponent, some graphs of exponential functions that vary in their base. So we know that that cancer biology example that we just looked at was the function f of x equals two to the x power. Notice that this graph, um, it sort of increases along its domain. So as we move to the right, this is increasing. We have a y-intercept here at zero comma one. Okay, and then the graph gets steeper and steeper and then moves beyond the graphing space that we have provided, okay? The next graph, is the function f of x is equal to three to the x power, okay? So notice that this graph in the middle looks very similar. It has the exact same shape. The graph is increasing along its domain. It crosses the y-intercept here at zero, one yet again, and then continues to grow ever steeper, okay? And then this third graph on the right, is the function f of x is equal to four to the x power. Yet again, we see that same ever increasing shape. It passes through the y axis at zero comma one and then continues getting steeper and steeper, okay? Notice one thing about these graphs is that they have the same general shape. They sweep upwards from left to the right, uh, but as we increase that base, so from two to three to four, you can probably see it's, it might be a little subtle, but each of these graphs gets a little bit steeper. Uh, so for instance, we can kind of see that this first graph of two to the X power looks like it crosses at two comma four right there, okay? But our next graph that has a base of three doesn't seem to cross through the point two comma four, it seems that it gets to a y value of four a little bit earlier. So here somewhere a little bit after one, uh, a little bit after a value of one, an x value of one, we've already gotten to a y value of four. And then you can notice that the third graph here on the right is also a bit steeper, even still compared to um, the middle graph, okay? So these functions have different bases, but they share many similarities, including their y-intercept. When the base of an exponential is a positive number, we can expect for this general shape to occur for its parent function, okay? But let's look at some graphs of exponential functions that have fractional bases. So on starting on the left, uh, our graph over here can be expressed or described by the function f of x is equal to one half raised to the x power, okay? So compared to those last three graphs that we looked at, this one looks like it's been reflected across the y-axis, right? It's going in the opposite direction. It's sweeping down from left to right. And then as we go to the middle graph here, it's also sweeping down from left to right, still passing through this y-intercept of zero comma one, but we have this function, 
Uh, one third is the base raised to the x power. Okay, and it looks more like it's a uh, sort of sister function over here on the left, but it's a bit steeper, right? The drop, the decline here is happening faster than our graph of one half raised to the x power on the left, right? This is kind of more of a gradual decline. And then this one's a bit of a steeper decline. And then as we look at the function f of x equals one over four raised to the x power, this is even steeper, okay? They're still all passing through that same y-intercept, so that's pretty interesting. But um, if you recall the negative exponent rule, uh, then it should make sense that compared to the last set of three functions that we looked at, uh, that these should sort of sweep down to the right. And that's because the exponential function that's of the form one over b raised to the x power, the fractional base can also be written instead with a whole number base and a negative exponent. Remember that negative exponent just tells you to flip the base to its reciprocal. So we could convert any of these. Let's say, for instance, I took this function here and applied that negative exponent rule. Then I could flip the base back to 2 instead of 1 half. But then I would have to change this to a negative x here, right? Just applying that negative exponent rule. Same thing over here for one third raised to the x power. That could be rewritten as flip the base to its reciprocal, so three. But then we need to change this to a negative exponent. Same thing over here with one four. We can flip the base to its reciprocal and then apply that negative exponent rule. Okay. And if we look at these graphs in terms of their negative exponent expression, Remember when we put a negative on the inside of the function, that that will flip the parent function's graph. So instead of looking something like this, having a negative inside the function, so this time inside the exponent, is going to reflect the parent function across the y-axis. And so that's why you see a kind of mirror image happening compared to those last graphs that we were looking at, okay? So hopefully that kind of relates to the ideas that we uh, explored before when we were first getting into transformations of function. Um, but you'll have a chance to play around with this a little bit in the Alex just to see how that's gonna work out, okay? In general, we have some broad properties that we can apply to all exponential functions. So first off, Exponential functions are one-to-one, -one, okay? That means that they pass the horizontal line test. So if you recall, if I draw horizontal lines on this graph, so let's say we have a horizontal line here that let's pretend for a moment that that's a straight horizontal line. This is y equals five. Our horizontal line only intersects our graph at one location. And so it doesn't matter where I draw that horizontal line, I'm only getting one intersection place. And so that tells me that my graph is one to one. Okay. Uh, the parent function for all these exponential functions all have a y-intercept at zero comma one. This point right here will be common among all of our uh, parent functions of exponential function. Okay. Now that might change if we apply some transformations, right? Because if we apply, apply some transformations, like if we shift this graph up, then that y-intercept and all the other points along this graph will also move up. Okay. And if we slide this over to the left or down or in any which way, then we can start to move these points around. Okay but the parent function will always have that y-intercept at zero comma one. We notice that there's also a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. So think about a sort of uh, imaginary boundary line here at the bottom of our graph. We can see the graph sort of as we move from the right to the left is sliding down closer and closer to the x-axis. 
but it actually never touches or crosses. Just gets really, really infinitesimally close. Okay. So we're getting closer and closer to that x axis, but not crossing it. And that's what we're calling the horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. But again, if we applied some transformations to this graph, let's say we move this graph up two units, then we should expect that horizontal asymptote to move up two units as well. Okay. As far as the domain and range of exponential functions go, uh, the domain of all exponential functions will be from negative infinity to positive infinity. We can see that in the graph. If we think about domain in terms of the width, how wide our function is, we can see that the graph goes all the way to the left towards negative infinity. Remember, we're using the x-axis to sort of measure out to the left. And then this goes to the right all the way towards positive infinity. Then that domain should make sense. The range for this particular function, which is the parent function, starts at zero, but we're not going to touch or cross zero. So that's going to be excluded from our range. And then our graph goes up to positive infinity. But in general, the range is going to depend on the transformations that are applied to the parent function. Okay. So the shape and the direction of the graph can vary. Uh, they can depend on the value of the base as we saw with those last few examples, but also any transformations that are performed on the parent function. And that's what we're gonna take a look at here momentarily. Okay, so exponential functions can be transformed using the same rules that we used in previous section. Uh, for instance, if we're looking at b raised to the x power, that's our generic exponential function, if I simply add or subtract a constant k to the outside of my function, then that will move the graph up and down. That is our vertical shift factor, OK? If I have b raised to the x, but inside the exponent part, I add or subtract a constant, let's call that h, then that's going to move my graph left or right. That's going to be responsible for the horizontal shift, OK? And as always, if I have a negative sign in front of my parent function, then that will reflect the graph across the x-axis. Usually, we just describe that as saying it flips our graph upside down. But remember, upside down means across the x-axis. Okay. And we already talked about reflections across the y-axis. That would be if we had a negative sign here in the exponent. So if we turn our attention to the graph over here on the right, uh, this blue dashed line indicates the original parent function of this exponential. Notice that the graph gets really, really close to the x-axis. I know that Desmos makes it look like it's touching the x-axis, but it actually isn't. Okay, So it gets really close to the x-axis, passes through this uh, y-intercept at 0, 0,1, and then grows and grows and becomes more steep as we go up and to the right, OK? This purple graph is the function g of x that I've written here on the right. g of x is equal to 2 raised to the x plus 4 minus 3 power, OK? So what you should be able to do on all of these functions is pick them apart and understand that when we're talking about adding or subtracting something on the inside of the exponent, so inside the parent function, uh, then that's going to move left or right. That's our horizontal shift. Okay, So that takes care of this guy. Uh, and if we have x plus 4 on the inside of our function, just know that that's going to move 4 units to which direction? If we have plus 4, Remember, we should be moving to the left. OK, that's a little bit deceptive. Uh, but remember, you can set x plus 4 equal to 0 to find out where the new center of that graph should be. And when we solve that equation, we get x equals negative 4, which we know would move us over here to the left. OK. Then that plus 3 on the outside of our 
function, I'm sorry, that minus three here on the outside of the function, it's gonna control whether the graph moves up or down. And since we're subtracting, this is gonna move down. And then we subtract three units. So again, relating this to the parent function, we've moved to the left four units. So we should be over here at negative four. And then we should move down three units. So this should take us down three units. And now we're at negative two. Remember, this point that we are using as our reference originally had a y value of one. So if we were at a y value of one right here, and we went down three units from there, then we're moving down one, two, three. That's what puts us at a y value of negative two because we started at a y value of negative one, okay? Okay, but essentially that's what we're doing. You have to make sure that that makes sense to you that we're moving to the left four then we move down three. And so this is the new location of that, what used to be our y-intercept. It has moved to the location negative four comma negative two. Okay. We can also see that the horizontal asymptote has moved down instead of being at zero. We said our graph moved down three units. So that horizontal asymptote, which was originally here, has moved down from zero to y equals negative three. Okay, so this graph over here on the right just represents our function uh, two raised to the x power, that's the parent function, but it's been shifted to the left four units and down three units. We haven't applied any other transformations, but just be aware that other transformations could be applied. Okay, so you're gonna encounter some problems in Alex that ask you to graph this function and determine its domain and range. And that should be a fairly simple process because it's the exact same process that we've been using to graph all other functions. All you need to do is create that function table, that XY table, choose some arbitrary X values. It doesn't matter what we choose uh, and then compute your Y values. So my uh, suggestion and my recommendation has always been that when we choose these X values, just choose some easy numbers, some small numbers that are easy to do math with. So I just arbitrarily chose zero, one, and two, and then I plug them into the function. So remember, if I'm plugging in zero to my function, then what I should write down is one fourth raised to the zero power. If we recall the zero exponent rule that we learned at the very beginning of the semester, we should know that anything raised to the zero power is one. But if you're not sure about that, then just use your calculator. Okay. There is no shame in just throwing that into the calculator. I would rather you be correct and understand this process than to uh, challenge yourself to do it in your head and then maybe make some mistakes there and get it wrong, okay? But again, just to recap, we're just taking these X values as the inputs that become the exponent for the parent, uh, for the function's equation. So one fourth to the one power is one fourth. And then if we raise one fourth to the second power, then we get one over 16, okay? You may encounter uh, the natural exponential function. And I think that for a lot of students that are not uh, math majors, that this becomes a bit confusing because we don't really know what the symbol E means, okay? But the symbol E here is just a number. It's a special number that mathematicians and scientists and engineers encounter over and over again in many different areas of life. Uh, it's kind of a cousin to pi, which we think of as being approximately 3.14. But now this new number that we have to get familiar with is called Euler's constant. I know that it looks like Euler, but is pronounced Euler. 
okay? Euler was a very famous mathematician. Uh, and although he didn't discover this number, for some reason, many things in math are named after him, including this constant. But the number E, uh, which is a button that's featured on your calculator, is just a number really, really close to 2.718, okay? Again, it's just a cousin of pi, which is approximately 3.14. E is approximately 2.718. Uh, whenever we need to use this exact value, we're going to use that button in the calculator. But in any case, you're going to run into an exponential function called f of x is equal to e raised to the x power. Okay, just remember that e is a number. It's a button in the calculator. It's just a number. We don't have to be intimidated by it. And this is called the natural exponential function because it just appears in so many places in, in math and engineering. So whenever you uh, approach problems that involve the natural exponential, graphing is going to take place the exact same way that we've graphed before. Uh, you are simply going to choose arbitrary x values to plug in to the exponent, right? So we want to plug in our input values here to the exponent. So for instance, if we chose to evaluate the function f of 2, for this exponential function, then that's the same thing as e raised to the two power. And if we put that in our calculator, we're gonna get approximately 7.389. So because we're getting approximate numbers here, um, you'll notice that Alex, whenever you're uh, doing the homework assignments in Alex, it will ask you to round to approximately three or four decimal places. Just make sure that whenever you put your answers in, that you round to the appropriate decimal value that it tells you in the homework platform, okay? But we go through the same process. We're just plugging in our X value. We're plugging in that input, letting our calculator do the work, and then we'll have our X, Y pair, and then we can plot our value. So for instance, if you look at this graph, this is the graph uh, E to the X here. Here's our function, and call it F of X equals e to the x. And if I were to take e and raise it to the zero power, I get a y value of one, which is why I have this point here. Remember, this is my x value zero. This is my function value, which is e to the zero power. And that's equal to one. Okay. If I plugged in a value of one, then there's my x value here. The y value or the function value that I would find is e raised to the one power, which as we know, e to the one power should be approximately 2.718. Okay, and we can find that in the calculator or we can just go back to the previous slide to see what the value of e is. Okay, and similarly here, if I said x is equal to 2, then I can find the y value simply by taking my function e raised to that power. So this is the second power, and the calculator will give me 7.389 and some change. Okay, but we're just going out to three decimal places for simplicity's sake. Okay, so the last few questions that are, you're gonna encounter in Alex uh, involve these money problems. Uh, so this is a slide on investing money and compound interest. When we put money into a savings or an investment account, our money grows through the power of compound interest. Uh, you certainly wouldn't wanna take your money to the bank. Let's say you deposited $10,000 and then you go back several months later and you only have $5,000, that would be a terrible bank because it's losing your money, okay? You wanna be able to securely take that $10,000, put it into an account, and then check it over time, maybe a year into the future or 10 years into the future, and that money should be uh, larger in amount than what you initially deposited, 
okay? Well, the rate at which money grows can be described by the following exponential function. So here we have the formula A equals P uh, times, in parentheses, one plus R over N, okay? All of that in parentheses is raised to the N times P power. I know that when you're first approaching this, that looks kind of complicated, but let's break it down piece by piece. A is equal to the future amount of money that you expect to have in the account at some future time, okay? P is equal to the principal. If you've ever taken out a home loan or an auto loan, then you know that sometimes the loan amount, the initial amount that you borrow is referred to as the principal. But that can also refer to your initial deposit in a savings account. Okay, so principal P uh, refers to the initial amount or the initial deposit. R uh, refers to the interest rate, okay? So usually the interest rate will be given as a percentage. We need to make sure that when we put it into the formula that we put that in as a decimal value, okay? N refers to the number of compounding periods, different kinds of savings account will offer different kinds of compounding periods and those affect how the money accumulates or grows in that account, okay? So that's just a number that's going to be given to us. And then P is time in years, okay? So if you're given a problem where they give you time in months, you need to make sure that you divide that by 12 because you need time in years, not time in months. So, some problems are simply going to require us to quote unquote plug and chug. That means we're gonna plug in the given investment or loan conditions to see how much money accrues over time, okay? So what you will do in these problems when you're solving for them is you're gonna have to write down what has been given to you. Was the principal given to you? Was the interest rate given to you? Do we know the compounding number? Uh, do we know how many time, uh, how many years um, we are going to be saving our money up for? Okay. So let's take a look at a concrete example of this. Okay. So imagine that you go to your local credit union to open up an individual retirement account. This is called an IRA. Okay. The representative of the bank tells you that all IRAs have a required opening deposit of $5,000. The money will be invested in that retirement account at an interest rate of 13% compounded monthly for a minimum of 35 years. Okay, so how much money do we expect to be in the account after that 35 year period? So what you need to be able to do when you approach these problems is the following. Read the word problem and make sure that you understand what each of these values that they give you mean. So if they say that the bank account requires an opening deposit, then that $5,000 refers to the principal P. Okay. It says that we're gonna invest this money at an interest rate of 13%. So that's gonna to refer to the variable R, which 13%, if you wanna convert this into a decimal, then you simply divide that number by 100 and we should get 0 0.13 as the decimal representation of that interest rate. That's what we need to use in our formula. Then it says that our money is being compounded monthly. And that's what you have to watch out for. Um, your compounding number is going to be given based on uh, a key word. So they won't actually give you a number in the word problem. You're going to have to look for that key word. So the key word here monthly is simply asking you how many months are in a year? Well, if you know that there are 12 months in a year, then N will equal 12. Okay. And there are some other keywords that you have to be aware of. I will post a, um, 
a handout that kind of breaks that down so that you know what it what it means when it says compounded quarterly or semi-annually or daily. Uh, those refer to different compounding numbers. So you'll have to be aware of that. Uh, but then it says that we're going to put the money in this account for 35 years. So 35 years refers to our time. So we know T is equal to 35. So now that we've sort of broken this all apart, we can think about what is that formula that we were given? Well, we were given this formula, A equals P times one plus R over N. All of that is raised to the N times T power. So we can start plugging some of these things in. And when we do that, we should get that A, the future amount, should be equal to 5,000 times one plus 0 0.13, our interest rate, divided by 12, our compounding number, all of that is raised to the 12 times 35 power, right? Where 12 is the compounding number and 35 is the time in year. Okay. And the nice thing is that if you're using your TI-84 calculator, you can type this in exactly as it is written. Okay, and when you type this part in right here, this fraction, just make sure you're using your fraction options and it will come out very pretty just like that. When we plug and chug, type that into the calculator and hit enter, we will get this number at the end. Okay, so what is the question asking us? It says, given these investment conditions, the bank account requirements, uh, given this principle, our initial deposit, this interest rate, this compounding number, uh, and the time period, how much money do you expect to have in the account after 35 years? Well, we expect that that initial deposit of $5,000 will grow to $461,724.62. We're just rounding off to two decimal places there just because whenever we talk about money, we only have two decimal places when we're talking about cents. Okay. But that $5,000 grew to nearly $500,000. Okay. And that might seem like a really big number. And I know some students uh, maybe get confused or get worried when they get answers that are really big. But no, like after 35 years of just that money sitting in the bank account at 13 percent interest rate, which is a really good interest rate, we sort of expect that money to grow to be really big, right? So that initial deposit grew to from 5,000 to almost 500,000, okay? And then we just uh, type in our answer, Alex should tell us that we got it correct, and then we go about our day, all right? It shouldn't be that difficult. Again, the one thing that you might have to watch out for is that compounding number uh, and just make sure you're understanding what value for N I need to plug in if I'm given a different keyword other than monthly. Okay. So the last scenario that you might run into is that there are problems where uh, the types of savings account that you're working with involve um, money that you deposit and it's compounded continuously. Okay. So this is a very key phrase, compounded continuously, because it means that we're going to throw out that previous formula that we were working with, and we have to use a new formula. So in these scenarios, we need to make use of the formula A equals P times E raised to the RT power, where E, if you recall, is our friend Euler's constant 2.718-ish. 2.718-ish, but we don't ever want to approximate that, okay? We want to make sure that we're using the exact value uh, or that button that our calculator gives us. So again, if we see a problem that says that in the bank account, your money is compounded continuously, then we'll have to use this new formula that says A is equal to the future amount, P is still the initial deposit or the principal, E refers to Euler's number, which is that button on our calculator. You will never use 
this approximated value because it might throw your answers off slightly. R is still going to be the interest rate and P is still time in years. Uh, but then you can plug and chug similar to that last problem and you should be good to go. So just be sure that when you're approaching problems in this section that you read those problems carefully so you know which formula to apply. Okay, and that pretty much concludes what you're going to see here in this section uh, 9.2 on exponential function. Okay, so make sure that you jump into Alex and you get some time to look that over so that if you have any questions, you can ask them when we get back to class.